So it's a great pleasure and privilege to have the chance to tell you about some of the research that I've been involved in on autism. And I'm very aware of the really illustrious and impressive audience that I need to talk to and also the wonderful mixture of disciplines and interests and backgrounds. But I hope that this topic will um, resonate with some of you. So as you know, autism is a neurodevelopmental condition that has a strong genetic component. Uh, the symptoms of autism are usually present before the age of three years, although sometimes the diagnosis is much later. And we can think about autism both in terms of the genetics and the neurobiology and the behavior, but it's also very important, I think, to think about the mind or to think about how children and adults with autism process and understand the world. And that's going to be the, the level of description that I'm mainly going to concentrate on. So autism is diagnosed behaviorally. We don't have a blood test or chromosome test, so the diagnosis is based on a child or adult showing clinically significant impairments in social interaction and communication and rigid and repetitive traits. And the manifestation of these varies enormously, leading to the notion of an autism spectrum. From, on the one hand, a young child of three or four who is silent, apparently has no language, uh, doesn't go to his or her parents even when distressed or hurt, and spends hours spinning the wheels of a toy car or watching water drip from their fingers, all the way up to an adult who may be in intellectually extremely able, who has a sort of Asperger-type picture, very socially interested, desperate to have a girlfriend, have friends, but systematically getting social interaction wrong, who has uh, no language difficulty at all and likes nothing better than to monologue about their own special interest, as I'm doing now, but doesn't understand <laughs> if somebody is lying or making a joke or being sarcastic, and whose narrow special interest may have evolved into something that really carves a niche for them in the world. So they may be um, uh, an astrophysics professor, for example. So a vast manifestation, um, and in the current diagnostic manual um, of the APA, we now have social and communication difficulties as one dimension, and rigid re repetitive behavior, including sensory sensitivities, as another dimension. So autism isn't rare. Um, when I first uh, entered autism research, it was considered to be a rare disorder, but we now know that around 1% of children and adults meet the current criteria for autism. And that's around 600,000 people in the UK alone. And it's important to emphasize the adults because there's a re real um, paucity of research on adults, and particularly on older adults with autism. Autism is perhaps more in the media than ever before, and you can barely open a, a newspaper or listen to the radio or watch the TV without seeing something about autism. And of course, a lot of that reporting is misleading. You'll read about scientists creating autistic mice, or there being some new miracle cure in the States for which you typically have to spend a lot of money. Autism is also very much in the media in fiction. And uh, many of you will have read A Curious Incident uh, of the Dog in the Nighttime, Rain Man was perhaps the first film that brought autism to public attention. Very notable in a lot of these um, fictional portrayals of autism is that the individual with autism will have a stunning special ability. The child or adult will be the one who can spot the pattern or break the code that handily uh, sews up the plot for the author. So is this just another of those myths? Well, actually, autism is strongly associated with talent, and striking talents are seen at a much higher instant in individuals with autism than in any other group that's been studied. So this presents us with a real puzzle. Here I'm showing you some of the drawings of a famous artist with autism called Nadia, and she did these drawings when she was three, and at that point um, she couldn't do up home buttons or eat with a knife and fork, she didn't have the coordination to allow her to do that, but if she was given a biro, and it had to be a biro, she could produce uh, really beautiful drawings like these. And often it's not only the final product, but the process that is absolutely amazing in uh, individuals with autism who show special talents. Stephen Wiltshire here is drawing the cityscape of Tokyo from memory after a 20 minute helicopter ride over the city. And although um, not every individual with autism has talent at the level of Stephen Wiltshire, 
There are uh, striking talents in perhaps a third of individuals with autism, something that they're really unusually good at compared to that other profile of abilities. And interestingly, these cluster into particular areas. So um, musical skill, particularly being able to play by ear, uh, math skill, uh, particularly mental calculation or um, cal calendrical calculation, knowing the day of the week that any date in the past or future will fall on, and memory skills, as well as the artistic skills that I've shown you. So why is autism linked to talent? And it's important at this point to say that in thinking about talent in autism, I'm not wishing away or um, denying the very real difficulties that individuals with autism and their families face. Um, so this little boy uh, may have the special talent that if uh, when he wakes up, one of those objects has been moved a fraction of an inch, he's going to have a meltdown and be inconsolable. And that may not seem to his family like a special talent, but his ability to notice a minute change in the environment is something that most of us don't possess. But of course, autism is a complex mixture of challenges, but also of some differences in processing that do very often, I believe, lead to talent. So why is autism linked to talent? Well, to try and unpack that, we need to look below the level of behavior to that level of cognition or information processing. How do people with autism see and understand the world? And I think there's no single explanation here that will suffice to explain the complex picture of autism. But I think we've got some good theories, and I'm going to go through three good candidate cognitive theories and try and explore whether they can help us to understand why talent is so common in autism. So I'll begin with a theory of helping us to understand why people with autism have such notable social and communication difficulties. And this is the idea, the theory, that uh, most individuals with autism have difficulty attributing mental states to other people. They find it difficult to know what you might be thinking. And this, by contrast, in neurotypical children, is an automatic, in fact, an obligatory ability that children show from at least the second year of life. And it's manifest in such simple things as a child learning to keep secrets or to tell lies. Those already show that a child is able to recognize that what they know isn't necessarily the same as what you know. And indeed, they can manipulate what you might know. And it's often tested whether with a very simple test called the Salian task. And uh, this can be acted out with dolls or with people. And you can see this portrayed. You have uh, introduced the characters, Sally and Anne. Sally has a basket, Anne has a box. And Sally has a ball which she puts in her basket while she goes out. Now, while she's out, naughty Anne moves the ball from the basket to her box. And then when Sally comes back in and she wants to play with her ball, the test question to the child or adult is, where will Sally look for the ball? Or where does Sally think the ball is? And from the age of about three and, and using cleverer technology, even younger in, uh, in infancy, if you use uh, eye tracking measures, Neurotypical children understand that Sally will look in the basket where she thinks the ball is, even though the children know that the ball in reality is in the box. But most children with autism, and indeed some adults with autism, will answer that Sally will look in the box, which is sort of a logical answer, but it doesn't take into account Sally's mistaken belief. Now, this goes a long way to explaining why people with autism find it difficult to understand, are you joking, are you lying? Because that's all about your intention as a speaker, and intention is a mental state, and they seem to find it difficult to read mental states. But it also shapes the learning environment for a child with autism. So you can see here um, the tendency that we have as neurotypical individuals to be guided by other people's interests and attention. So if you walk along the street and everyone's pointing up at something, it's almost impossible not to look. That's how we're programmed. And so here you might see two little boys, the one uh, uh, who's looking towards us, maybe a neurotypical child, who's interested in playing with the pots and pans, but even more interested in what his mother or father think about what he's doing. Is he going to get told off? Are they going to join in? And by contrast, the other little boy who's stacking the tins is interested in what he's doing, and that's all he's interested in. That has his sole focus of attention. And his learning, his development, is not going to be shaped by what everybody else thinks. He's not automatically going to be interested in the things that other people are interested in. And maybe that brings some benefits as well as some challenges. So I think there are three ways that mind blindness or lack of theory of mind may enhance talent in people with autism. Firstly, 
the ability to maintain your own focus of interest, unaffected by other people's interests, may mean that you can avoid becoming a member of the herd. So you're not wearing those blinkers that we probably take on more and more, especially as we become teenagers, to only be interested in what everyone else is interested in. Secondly, we potentially don't, uh, we, we as neurotypicals, spend a lot of our time and our neural processing in understanding other people. And while we are amazingly impressed by an autistic savant who can memorize a telephone directory, uh, somebody coming uh, from Mars would be amazingly impressed that you can recognize thousands upon thousands of faces. You may not be able to name them all, but you can say if they're familiar or not, and that's a savant ability. It just happens to be one that we all share, so it doesn't surprise us. If we devoted that time and neural processing to other skills, maybe as people with autism do, that might go some part of the way to explaining their extraordinary talents. And the last is more speculative. We've done some work that's shown that people with autism have a different sort of self-awareness, that recognizing their own thoughts may also be different. And this may relate to uh, a greater ability to enter a, a state of flow, which is often described in uh, sports psychology as uh, that state of being unconscious of your surroundings, completely enveloped in the task in hand, and which is a very productive, also a very pleasant state. And I don't play golf, but I've been told that the way to put off your opponent in golf is to ask them to tell you exactly how they're going to take the next shot. Because some things are better done without too much self-reflection. And this may be something that comes easier to people without, with autism. So that's the understanding of the social part of autism. What about a theory that would help us to understand something about the rigid and repetitive behavior in autism? Well, an important part of the autism cognitive phenotype seems to be executive dysfunction. So executive function is the umbrella term given to all of those uh, higher order functions uh, typically subserved by the prefrontal cortex that allow us to cope with novelty and change. So they allow us to monitor our behavior, to be flexible and to suppress habitual behavior that's no longer relevant. Some very interesting research has suggested that in some case of frontotemporal dementia, there are released talents. So this is the case of Anne Adams as an example, who um, very nobly allowed herself to, to be studied as she went into dementia, and as her artistic talent and her artistic productions became really much more marked and uh, exaggerated and impressive, um, exactly as her uh, frontal cortex was deteriorating. And based in part on those findings, Alan Snyder has made the rather extraordinary suggestion that we might be able to turn off our frontal lobes to release savant-like skills. Now, I'm not entirely convinced, I have to say, by this. And uh, if you look at the pictures of the dog drawn um, uh, before, during, and after TMS, trans magnetic stimulation to shut off temporarily part of the uh, cortex, I'm not sure it's quite savant stuff, but it's an interesting, interesting theory. It also, of course, uh, completely ignores development to think that we can simply uh, make a, a momentary lesion that's going to create a savant. But it is very important to remember that although autism is marked by rigidity and uh, repetitive preferences in behavior and in thought, actually repetition is not the enemy of creativity. So the third and last aspect of autistic cognition I want to mention in relation to talent is um, uh, an extraordinary eye for detail, which has been sometimes referred to as weak central coherence. And Kanner, indeed, who was one of the first people to describe autism, talked about autism as being marked by an inability to experience holes without full attention to the constituent parts. And he goes on to explain how, for a child with autism, if you change any tiny detail of a situation, it's no longer recognized as being the same thing. And indeed, there are uh, children with autism I know, for example, who, when their teacher gets a different set of glasses, no longer seems to recognize the teacher or calls her by the name of somebody else who happens to have the same type of glasses frames. And this idea of eye for detail uh, is uh, well captured in a National Autistic Society poster, which um, says, when a person with autism walks into a room, the first thing they see is a pillow with a coffee stain shaped like Africa, a train ticket sticking out of a magazine, um, 35 floorboards, a remote control, a paper clip on the mantelpiece, a marble under the chair, and et cetera, et cetera. And at the bottom it says, so it's hardly surprising they ignore you completely. 
And perhaps the most important aspect of this theory of autism is that it highlighted for the first time that we can learn as much about autism by looking at what people with autism are better at compared to neurotypicals versus what they find difficult. So um, people with autism, for example, with the eye for detail that they show, are often very good at this kind of task, spotting the difference. And unless you happen to have autism or be sitting next to somebody with autism, you may not have spotted all the difference. And when I gave this talk um, uh, to an audience that had people with autism, they also pointed out some other ones that I was missing. Um, I think this one here. So. And we've also used various um, tests that can demonstrate this eye for detail through superior performance. So here in the embedded figures task, you have to find the simple shape hidden in, camouflaged in the compound shape, which we see, of course, as a gestalt, but people with autism may see as a, a, a set of parts put together. And this goes some way towards explaining why, for example, in the artistic savant domain, most artists show an extraordinary attention to detail and often produce their drawings by drawing detail to detail rather than sketching the whole. This is um, a beautiful cityscape drawn by uh, Gilles Train, who is a multi-talented savant. Among other things, we've published a case study of his ability to identify the pitch of any environmental sound and of voices and so on. And indeed, he was late to speak, but when he did speak, he asked his parents, uh, why does mummy say hi in C and daddy says hi in G? So you can see his eye for detail. You can also see the creativity in this imagined city that he created. It also seems to go some way towards explaining uh, musical savants and uh, skills in other areas. So uh, musical savants uh, almost universally show absolute pitch. And whereas ordinary children uh, transition from uh, remembering songs by precise pitches to remembering the melody of a song, individuals with autism seem to maintain the ability to remember the exact exemplars. Um, and indeed, many children with autism who don't have any musical training show that they actually have absolute pitch if, if tested. So we've uh, gone on to try and, and find out why it might be and which aspects of autism go with talent. And very briefly, we've used the Twins Early Development Study um, which is a study of all the twins born in England and Wales in 94 to 96, to try and look at the relationship between talent and autism. And this is a population-wise study, so we used trait-wise measures of autistic traits, so how good is your child at maintaining conversations, for example. We asked parents at eight um, these various trait-wise questions about autism. We also asked them, is your child unusually good at music, maths, art, or memory much better than children even a lot older. And what we found was that the children for whom their parents said, uh, yes, he has a special talent, were also said to have more autistic traits and specifically to have more autistic traits of the rigid and repetitive sort that we've linked to that eye for detail. And uh, when we did cross-twin, cross-trait correlations and twin modeling, we found that effectively, uh, quite a large proportion of the genetic influence on those autistic traits is overlapping with the genetic influence on having talents, parent reported talents. So ingredients for talent in autism, an eye for detail, a mind insulated from other minds, fixed and persistent interests that all come together in people with autism. And each of these may be important in talent in the general population, but in autism we have this, this magical catalytic mix. Uh, why does it matter? Uh, because for people like Natty Jones, who has half, hardly any language, the joy of communicating through his art and the respect that he achieves through his art is really worthwhile. And music is a space that neurotypical and autistic people can absolutely speak the same language in. And low self-esteem, depression, anxiety uh, make life miserable for people with autism and can be significantly improved by the development of skills and skills that can go on to employment and many companies that now specifically seek to employ people with autism. So uh, thank you to the many people who've worked on this. Thank you to the Academy of Medical Sciences for asking me to speak. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>